Then the countries began slowly to gain their independence from the colonizers. In 1961, Tanganyika became independent Tanzania and Nereri its president. And in 1963, Britain handed over power to Kenyatta after a long struggle. Today, with over 20 years of independence behind it, Kenya still grows and exports large amounts of tea to Britain. And just across the border in Tanzania, Mount Kilimanjaro dominates a landscape where coffee is still produced on the same coffee estates. The Germans planted these estates before the First World War and then passed them on to the British. With independence, the Tanzanian state took over the ownership and has run them ever since. Coffee is still a major export crop for Tanzania and one of the few things that the country can sell on the world market to earn foreign currency. The red coffee cherries ripen during the summer months and have to be picked by hand. John has been employed permanently on the plantation for the last 34 years. On a plantation like this one, there used to be up to 400 or 500 workers. But now, you get only about 20. For a big plantation to have only 20 workers, what's the point? People have changed their minds and have moved to village instead of working in plantations. Some have gone back to their family homes. The only people left are people like me. John's wife, Elwaza, has also worked on the plantation for a long time. <laughs> But there are now few long established workers, so a lot of casual labour is used. Children frequently work on the estate to help their parents and add to the family earnings. As John is a senior picker, he supervises the other workers. Sarah is John and Alwaza's oldest unmarried daughter. She's independent of her parents and leads her own life. Her father built her a house next to the family home where she lives by herself. She takes great pride in her house and looks after it well. She's decorated the walls with pictures and graffiti in Swahili and English. Sarah's many friends helped her with this, and whenever she has free time, she spends it with them. <laughs> Sarah and her generation make their own decisions about their working lives and these are not necessarily the same as their parents. Working in the plantation is hard. I've worked there and I thought it was hard work for very little pay. It's not sufficient for anything. The pickers on the plantation are paid according to how many tins of coffee cherries they've picked. An average is between two to three tins a day, which when they cash in their tickets will earn them between 60 and 70 pence. And if the cherries are carelessly measured, they earn even less. John knows that there is no future for his children working on the estate. 
There's no profit in it, only loss. Where else, and during their leave, they may come and visit me, then go back home. Now they refuse completely to work in the plantations. You remember when you asked Sarah if she would like to work in a plantation, and she said no. After independence, the Tanzanians took over a plantation system which was organized originally by the Europeans for their own benefit. The rates of pay for workers is still something over which Mr. Swai, who manages the farm, has very little control. He's governed by the price the coffee sells for on the world market, and so the future is never secure. Yeah, the future of coffee is there only if the world market for coffee remains what it is, and if the farmers, uh, coffee farmers are paid um, their dues, Right now we are getting about 60, 70 shillings per kilo of coffee we sell. It's extremely low. So, coffee farming is unreliable for both the Tanzanian coffee board and the workers who are at the mercy of a world market. Sarah therefore decided that being independent of the coffee plantation will be better for her. So to earn money, she set up her own small business. With a friend, she makes and sells fried donuts. Every weekday, she travels to a local market. Markets are crucial to daily life in Tanzania. Most of the farming is done by the women who come here from miles around to sell, barter or buy produce. Sarah knows the markets well and arrives early to make sure she sells all her donuts. If she sells her basket full today, she can make about four pounds. All the women here make ends meet by regularly selling and buying at markets such as this one. Sarah is doing well. She knows what sells and has worked hard to make her business profitable. She is well known in the market and her donuts are appreciated. With no other opportunities for employment apart from working on the estate, she would have been far less independent of her parents. If I didn't work, where would I get things like soap, cream and clothes? I would have to wait for my father to provide me with everything. At the shop on the estate, the workers can buy the basic essentials, sugar, flour, salt, but prices are high, and they don't earn enough to be able to buy such extras as soap and new clothes, which Sarah can afford. <laughs> the workers who queue daily for their pay find it very difficult to manage on an average of 90 pence a day. <laughs> For Alwaza, who have to count every penny, it's a relief that Sarah is no longer dependent on her and John. Despite his low pay, John has managed to provide for his large family. 
This is because he also has his own small plot of land in a nearby village. Here he grows maize, which is their basic food. Maize is a staple diet for many Africans. The cob can be roasted or ground into a flour. Only his land has given him some security, unlike those workers who live in houses provided by the estate and who would lose both their houses and their plots of land if they lost their jobs. They do manage to grow extra food for themselves on small plots provided by the estate, but the land doesn't belong to them. You should not just rely on the estate. You may find that you are working in this plantation and tomorrow you are sacked and told to move. And you have belongings, children and a wife. If you are forced out, where would you go? Where would you live? You will start running here and there asking for a place to keep your children. It is important to look for a permanent place to stay while you are strong. If you are working today, tomorrow you may be fired, and where will you go? Life for rural Africans is hard. John does have a job, but his working life has been shaped by a world market on which he has very little influence. Tanzania's is a high-quality coffee. Once the coffee is dried and milled, it's sold to the coffee marketing board. Tanzania's coffee beans are sold primarily to European buyers, to Switzerland, Italy, Britain, and the majority goes to Germany. The price that the coffee producers get is set by the overseas buyers. The producers and sellers have little influence. The markets operate for the benefit of the European buyers rather than the producers. There is too much coffee on the world market, so the prices are low. It's multinational companies such as Nestles, which employ people in the industrialized countries to process the coffee beans. So, by the time the coffee gets to the supermarket, this is how the proceeds are divided up. For a jar of instant coffee costing £2, 20p goes to the shopkeeper, 20p is spent on advertising, 75p goes to the manufacturer, 75p stays in the producing country, and of that, around one penny goes to the coffee picker. Much of the wealth created by coffee flowed into Britain along with all the other imports from the colonies. This established a relationship between Britain and Tanzania that remains much the same today. They grow the beans and we drink the coffee. take coffee drinking for granted and don't expect to pay much for it as we're in a position to pick and choose. Nigel Toos has worked in Africa and studied the coffee trade. 
If you look at the number of countries around the world that produce coffee, they're all third world countries, all without much bargaining power, and the big companies can choose which countries they're going to buy their coffee from. So, for example, if they decide that the Tanzanian coffee isn't a very good quality this year, they can simply switch and buy from, say, Brazil. Um, again, Tanzania is left with very little room for manoeuvre for a product that they depend on so extensively. Well, there's two ways around it for a country like Tanzania. One is to grow other things, but the main attempt that Tanzania has made has been to try and buy into the rest of the process. So not just to be a producer of coffee beans, but to process it themselves in Tanzania, to market their own finished product themselves. And Tanzania has made very big efforts to attempt to break into that stage of the coffee production. You can buy Tanzanian coffee over here, but you have to get it from small companies who deal in third world products and who sell it in their shops or by mail order. So Tanzania's tried and they produce their own, but they're competing against such big companies that they, they, uh, they just don't have the chance. People's lives have been shaped and are still shaped by a structure laid down by Europeans when they first divided up Africa for themselves. At the moment, we Europeans still benefit most from this. So what sorts of policies would ensure that the younger generation growing up in Tanzania today have a more secure and fairer future? <laughs> 